Congratulations. <laughs> no, do it, do it. <laughs> Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Monday, November 16th at 7.01 p.m. and certainly want to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. I'll ask if our Councilman Brown would lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. <laughs> Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, let me ask you all the announcements by members of the council. I want to recognize Councilman Shule for one, and then Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, uh, on, on Saturday, we had the fourth annual Shule Challenge in which city employees try to beat me in a five-mile race. Um, some did. Um, and uh, it was a great day. We had beautiful weather. We had 47 city employees and 14 of their family members. And um, we started at mile zero of the American Tobacco Trail, went out to mile two and a half and back. I <clears throat> uh, wanted to thank uh, some folks from HRD Buyers and Michelle Cash especially and Megan O'Neill who is 
uh, works for Blue Cross and Blue Shield with the city uh, and the county, and they did a great job. Uh, and according to custom, I will read the names of the people that beat me. Uh, but before I do so, I want to also commend the city for the Desk to 5K program, which is we have uh, our employees, many of whom are sedentary, are trying to get up to running a 5K, and the HR department has now established a program where they are doing so, and about 10 of the Desk to 5K people are out and uh, making progress towards their 5K, which is going to be held on December 12th. So I wanted to commend our HR department on that. Steve, I don't know if we have time for you to read all those names. Oh, that really hurts me, <laughs> Of the me, people who beat you. That really hurts. Well, we're trying to shorten this meeting. <laughs> so here's who beat me. Uh, first place was Jonathan Baker. I want to say that Jonathan from Public Works ran the, uh, ran the five miles in under seven minute miles, so he's fast. Is he here? I don't think Jonathan's here. He's tired. He's tired, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. He's exhausted. Dan Schulman in finance, Randy Stewart from inspections who likes to come in first every year but didn't this year. Uh, Kristen Randall from Parks and Rec is listed next but I'm pretty sure I actually beat her. Um, Eric Halstead from Public Works uh, who always runs really well. Sean McKnight from Public Works, Todd Hoffman from Fire, James Liani from uh, Police, John Scott from Human Resources, and I will say that, I hate to say this one, Mr. Mayor, but William Bo Ferguson from the city manager's office beat me, which really hurt. Yeah. Councilman Shul, one thing I heard this morning, I'm sorry to interrupt, was that uh, part of that challenge was anybody that beat you, you would uh, provide them a beverage of their choice, but that you scheduled the race so early in the morning that by the time you got back, the bar hadn't opened yet. <laughs> Oldest trick in the book. <laughs> Uh, that's right, Tyler's was closed this year, so uh, we will be having a happy hour, not only for those that beat me, but for uh, those that didn't, and uh, that'll be scheduled through the HR department. You're exactly right. Let me just, I, the last thing I do want to say is some of the departments there, Parks and Rec, the fire department had several people and they were fast. Um, budget and management, uh, I did beat Melinda Squires Nelson this year, she keeps saying she's going to beat me, but she never has. I beat Don O'Toole, I just want to make that clear. Uh, so uh, we had city attorney, finance, fire, public works, water management, uh, human resources. Diana Schreiber was there from the clerk's office. Um, community development, solid waste, neighborhood improvement services, fleet management, including Joe Clark was there, which was great. And um, pretty, much every, pretty much every department. So just wanted to thank the HR department, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, we'll be having a happy hour. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's great, Steve. Appreciate it. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to congratulate um, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden for her election to the uh, National Board of Directors for the National League of Cities. So glad to have your representation. Any, any other? comments by members of the council. Uh, if not, uh, entertain priority items first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Good evening, everyone. Uh, four priority items this evening. Agenda item number four, landscape maintenance and grass mowing contract for the fire administration building, garage, and fire training grounds. The contract was revised to accurately f reflect uh, the numbered pages that were listed in section four in the exhibits. Agenda item number 10, proposed economic development incentive agreement between the City of Durham and Project Iron Man. The title, motion, and memo agreement and attachments have now been revised to include the actual name of the company. Agenda item number 11, proposed economic development incentive agreement between the City of Durham and Project Cavalier. Uh, the title, motion, memo agreement, and attachments for this also have been revised to include the name of the, con of the company, and we'll be reviewing that when we uh, get to that portion of the agenda. And then agenda item number 14, a quarterly crime report for the third quarter. The report and presentation and uh, our update to the uh, Civilian Police Review Board and the Human Relations Commission recommendations have been added to the agenda. Thank you. Entertain a motion on managers' priority items. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero.
Thank you. Recognize the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, members of council, if I could just have a moment, I'd like to introduce uh, Boy Scouts from Troop 424. Uh, I've got some notes here, and I'll have to go to the glasses to make sure I, I, I get this right. Um, again, we've got Boy Scouts from Troop 424. They're chartered by the Immaculate Conception Catholic Parish. These Boy Scouts are attending tonight's meeting as a part of their work for the Citizenship uh, Community Merit Badge required for them to become Eagle Scouts someday. The purpose of this BSA Merit Badge is to encourage good citizenship through teaching Boy Scouts how local government works and how to participate in government so that they make a positive impact on our community. In attendance with these Boy Scouts is Senior Assistant City Attorney Fred Lamar, who is an Assistant Scoutmaster for the troop and is designated counselor for the citizenship in the Community Merit Badge. Uh, also, uh, Ms. Deborah Posback is in attendance uh, and is the Troop 424 Outings Chair. And if the troop could rise. <coughs> That's all I have for you tonight. That's great. Welcome. I recognize City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that being the case, we'll proceed with the agenda as public. The first item is the consent agenda. And the consent agenda may be approved with a single vote if a council member or a person from the audience chooses to remove an item from the consent agenda. We will discuss that item later in the agenda tonight. Uh, the first item in the consent agenda is the Durham Convention and Business Bureau Tourism De Development Authority reappointment. Item two is 2016 City Council meeting schedule. Item three is an ordinance to amend the fee schedule for hydrant meter deposit fees. Item four is the landscape maintenance and grass mowing contract for the Fire Administrative Building Academy Fire Maintenance Garage and Fire Training Grounds, which is a priority item with changes by the City Manager. <clears throat> item five is the proposed sale of various easements to 101 West Chapel Hill Street Partners, LLC. Item six is U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Fair Housing Contract for fiscal year 2015-2016. Item seven is Human Relations Commission recommendations for Water Management Department, the report. Item eight is authorization to execute an amended contract for a total amount not to exceed $91,323 for full staffing analysis of the police department by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Item 9 through 11, these items can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Item 14 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So moved, second. Mr. Property moves a second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. We close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, we move to the general business agenda, item 14, which is a quarterly crime report for the third quarter. Recognize the chief of police, Jose Lopez. Mr. Mayor, council, city manager, city attorney. Uh, Giving the uh, January to September 2015 report, first of all, I'll start with the mission of the Durham Police Department, which is to minimize crime, promote safety, and enhance the quality of life in partnership with our community. The Police Department's quarterly report covers the department's six performance measures as listed. The report also includes additional statistics and information about significant accomplishments and highlights during the third quarter of 2015. Part one index crime was down slightly during the first nine months of 2015. There were decreases in reported rapes, burglaries, larcenies, and overall property crime. Part one violent crime was up by 16% at the end of September 2015. The rise in violent crime was driven by an increase in the number of aggravated assaults, robberies, and homicides. One incident in August accounted for 29 aggravated assaults, including eight people who were injured. The number of aggravated assaults is up 6% over 2015, while the number of victims, which is the way we count this statistic, is up by 17%. We've conducted two violent incident responses this year in response to increases in aggravated assaults. 
During these responses, officers focused on identifying possible suspects, gathering information, and being highly visible in areas where these crimes were being committed. The most recent one was during August and September in Hinson Drive and Southside areas. The results of these responses are in your, your report. Part 1 violent crime accounted for approximately 17% of all part one crime during the first nine months of 2015, compared to 14.5% uh, in 2014. Although there were 25 homicides and two fatal self-defense shootings reported during the first nine months of 2015, 17 of the 25 homicides have been cleared by arrest. Two other cases were ruled self-defense and one was an officer involved shooting, leaving five cases uh, open. One of the homicides is a case in which a victim was shot in 2011, but died as a result of his injuries during this year. Nine of these cases involved domestic violence, and four of these nine cases involved victims three years old and younger. We've had fewer gang-related homicides during the first nine months of 2015. There were six member-based homicides in 2015, compared to 11 during the same period in 2014. There have been 34 homicides year to date compared to 21 homicides on this date in 2014. Reported sexual assaults were at a three year low during the first months of 2015. The number of robberies increased, but investigators made several arrests, clearing multiple robberies this year. Officers arrested six people in April, and members of that group were charged with committing a dozen armed robberies during April. Officers also arrested five people in September on multiple armed robbery charges. And this weekend, we also made a substantial arrest, arrested two individuals for multiple robberies that they've committed in which we believe we're targeting Hispanics. Property crime was down by 3% at the end of September due to drops in reported burglaries and larcenies. Larcities make up more than half of our part one crime. Shoplifting accounted for 27% of our larcenies during the first nine months of this year. Larcenies from vehicles and of vehicle parts made up to 41% of our larcenies. During the third quarter, officers arrested several people for multiple property crimes. You can find more information on these arrests in your report. Clearance rates for homicides, robbery, and motor vehicle thefts were above the FBI national average of clearance rates for cities of our size. We've had several multiple victim cases this year, which are often harder to clear due to a lack of cooperation. We believe that in many cases, people know who did it, but they do not provide the information to the police. And we also have had an increase in violent crimes this year, but we've not had an increase in the number of investigators. There were 6,585 priority calls, priority one calls from January 1st, 2015 through September 30th, 2015. This is a 29% increase over the same period in 2014. We did not meet our standard of responding to 57% of our priority one calls in under five minutes. And we did not meet our five minute and 48 second minute average response time standard. Also, the average response time was six minutes and six seconds, which is a difference of 18 seconds. Although our sworn ranks are at full staffing, we currently have 37 operational vacancies due to recruit officers being in various stages of training. Because of attrition, injuries, sickness, court time training, and vacation, patrol districts are never staffed at 100%. Individual staffing levels for patrol districts can range from a low of 12, of 42% to a high of 72%. Inadequate staffing creates an extra heavy workload on officers, making them call driven and not allowing the time they need to leave their vehicles for more positive interactions with citizens. A diminished police presence also adversely impacts the ability to deal with crime. Effective November 27th through December 31st, the police department is using our asset forfeiture funds and the amount not to exceed $60,000 to finance an overtime initiative to supplement authorized positions in uniform patrol that are temporarily vacant. 
This initiative will enhance beat integrity, allowing for a better distribution of workload in the city's five patrol districts. This will result in improved law enforcement services. And our objective with this holiday initiative is to ensure a minimum staffing level in the districts of 75%. There were 10 non-sworn vacancies at the end of the third quarter. 25 Durham police recruits graduated from the basic law enforcement training 41 on August 3rd. And we currently have a basic law enforcement uh, training class in progress. October 21st, we had our annual employee lunch serving them for serving us, where we served our uh, employees at the police department. In October, uh, also hosted a statewide violence summit here in Durham, where we had uh, members of, uh, command members of different police departments throughout the state come in and discuss uh, the trend towards uh, violent crime issues, its trends, and also to try to identify violent crime reduction strategies and also set the conversation for January's uh, North Carolina Chiefs of Police Association meeting. I was one of 23 law enforcement representatives that attended an armchair discussion about crime at the White House in October uh, with President Obama. The Durham Police Department was chosen, I believe, because of the uh, diversion programs that we have uh, in place here in the city and much of the discussion was relative to diversion programs and keeping individuals out of jail. I'd like to end this presentation with a photo of our newest patrol car. We'll have five of these Mothers Against Drunk Driving patrol cars, one for each district. These patrol cars will be used on regular patrols as well as special events such as Booze It and Lose It and uh, DWI checkpoints. We also uh, will move into the holiday season. We hope that these new cars will serve as a reminder not to drink and drive. And as I understand it from MAD, the city of Durham is the first ones to have MAD cars. So you'll be seeing them out there. And with this, this concludes my last uh, crime report for the city of Durham. Thank you. They are the best. Thank you, Chief. And um, I'm sure there are probably some questions by members of the council, but uh, I want on behalf of the council to thank you for your service and your report. And although you still have some more time with us, we'll be seeing you around. But since this is your last report, I wanted to publicly thank you for your service to the city. Recognize Councilman Brown. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Chief Lopez. Um, I guess most people don't realize that the <clears throat> average tenure of an urban police chief is about, I think, three and a half years. Uh, you've been here close to eight, I think. Uh, over eight. Over eight, excuse me. Willing to do ten. So. Uh, you have far exceeded the national average. And we just want to thank you for your personal service and wish you good speed and good luck in your retirement, which is well deserved. Not prepared to retire, so I will be working. Oh, okay. Well, please take a hiatus period of vacation, long vacation, cruise, whatever. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, during the the recent campaign for city council, the sort of the hue and cry was for more uh, community policing. Uh, part of which is, I guess, for police officers to get out of their patrol car and walk uh, the neighborhood. So the question I have. In your judgment, is this really a worthwhile endeavor? And can we actually do this with the staffing report that you gave us this evening? And I say do this in a meaningful, meaningful manner, not just as a, a gesture. Well, currently, the uh, Durham police officers do a lot of uh, 
dr driving and then they park their cars and walk. Uh, they do have a lot of hours that they put to that, the, the park and walk. As far as having officers assigned to just do that, like many other police departments who say they're community policing efforts or that, uh, I don't think with the staffing we have at this point in time that we'd be able to do it, although we are uh, currently looking into uh, reallocating our resources and seeing what we could do. So we're working with the consultants in reference to, uh, to seeing how to best uh, use the resources that we have. But nevertheless, I think that uh, with more resources, there's a lot more that, that could be done. And I think that's reflective in a lot of other police departments. Uh, it's always good to step out and speak to and meet your community. And I think that's something that we emphasize with our officers, but at the same point in time, we have to look at their workload. Okay. My second qu question concerns a uh, rather interesting report that some of us received this afternoon uh, from Self Help Credit Union. And they did an analysis of marijuana arrest. And it showed according to their analysis that uh, blacks uh, comprise over 80% of those charged with this misdemeanor and white people much, much smaller. And under the age of 25, uh, blacks who only comprise 15% of the population but represent 46% of those charged, once again, with marijuana possession. And apparently, even after the, the recent reforms that this council supported in terms of making uh, marijuana arrest a much uh, smaller priority within the department, um, we still arrest more people than other uh, so-called progressive cities in the nation. Now, a misdemeanor, as some of you know, uh, can cost close to $400 in court fines and uh, court fees, I should say, in fines. Uh, what is your response to that? And, Vis -a -vis two. Well, first of all, I'm not familiar with that report. I've not right. read it. it just, I just that, got it. That's second. one. Uh, right. Second, uh, marijuana arrests have, have not been, as long as I've been here, a priority with the Durham Police Department, in spite of what other people may believe. Uh, I would have to really look at the numbers to see exactly what and why, because the numbers don't tell the full story. You really have to look at it. And, and I would recommend to uh, people out there who are concerned about this that they not smoke marijuana. Sorry that they that they not smoke marijuana. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, perhaps I did in the '60s, but <laughs> that's I think a there's long a statute. Time ago. I think the statute of limitations <laughs> saved you. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> of course, I said perhaps, but uh, um, and then finally, I'd like to get your insight. You know, we are obviously disappointed in some of the numbers that we see with the increases in various crimes. But the more I read, including the recent report from the Charlotte police chief as of last week, this unfortunately is becoming, particularly once again in the, in the urban cities, a, a national phenomenon. Do you have, uh, what's your insight on why this is happening? As far as why, I think we still have too many individuals who are, especially our youth, who are more inclined to use uh, weapons and use violence as a means by which to deal with their issues. I think that's one of the biggest problems. We also, as I've been saying for eight years, we need to get more of a community commitment to find solutions and address this problem. And when I say find solutions, I don't mean uh, make a demand, I mean find a solution. Uh, work with uh, the different groups uh, within your city work with the police department, work with social services, work with the education, and also work with other parents to mentor them so that they can better raise uh, their children and, and find a way out of it. I think there are a lot of uh, different programs out there that we have to look at, and we have to take the mental health issues of our youth very seriously. Uh, sadly enough, through media, 
they're experiencing so much trauma as they look at the violence that occurs throughout the, the world, and it impacts them, and I think that we need to address that also. Uh, their access to social media is not helping. Uh, parents have to be a lot more guarded on it. That's a danger that a lot of us maybe did not know as we were growing up, but it's real today. So all these things put together, I think the community really needs to step up and start working towards it and finding the solutions that need to be had and having the conversations that nobody's having. Thank you, Chief, and let me conclude. I know that at times, uh, perhaps you and, and certainly some of the officers here this evening, I think the, the city council may be a little naive in certain areas. But rest assured, gentlemen and ladies, that no one up here on this council does not dismiss the challenging job that all of you have, all of you have on a day-by-day -day basis, and we fully appreciate that. Um, well, I, it's just an unbelievable challenge in every city, and especially here in Durham as well. And we thank you so much for your good service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, welcome. Are there other comments? Recognize Councilman Moffitt and Councilman Shule, followed by the Mayor Pro Tem. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first thing, I just wanted to comment on the report. Just a very small comment, but I wanted to underscore that um, I noticed that you're using. Um, Justice Assistance Grant funds in support of the mental health outreach program, and I just wanted to uh, uh, just express my support. Um, I thought that was a great use of the funds. I also <clears throat> wanted to ask a question on behalf of Council Member Elect uh, Jillian Johnson, who read the report and asked about, noted that the number of homicides related to domestic violence, and asked about. Um, the work that you're doing today, your department is doing uh, with organizations that focus on domestic violence prevention? We have and a domestic violence unit that works very closely with the different uh, advocacy groups here in the city, and we also work with them in order to get the, the message out and get uh, information out to this community. Okay. And, and um, do you think that there are additional opportunities for further collaboration or there's always opportunity for more collaboration. I think that we need to get more people involved in it. Okay. There also needs to be more of our awareness and also more of a, of a desire for a community to feel safe to contact its police department in order to, you know, report their, uh, you know, any domestic violence. Thank you. Um, earlier today, uh, not much earlier, I don't know if you got it because I, I discovered about uh, 2.30 that I hadn't actually sent the email. I asked you two or three questions from the report. Did you, did you see that by any chance? Um, don't go looking for it if you're... We had three great camps. And uh, in the great camps, we had 85 uh, campers participate. We also had 11 kids participate in the, uh, the Thomas Membership Academy. Thank you. And then we corrected the uh, typographical error that was on the slide. Was that it? I, I, I can't remember if I had one more question. It sounds I was getting like a haircut you hit all the high points. I was getting a haircut at the time, so I didn't memorize all of them. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the information on the great camps and the Thomas mentoring um, event. Thanks. Thank you. And like everybody else, I want to thank you for your service. I know you're on duty for uh, several more weeks yet, so not quite out the door, but um, do appreciate the years of service that you've brought to the city. Recognize Councilman Shule, Councilman Mark, and Councilman Shule, the Mayor Pro Tem, and Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, the, a couple things that, uh, I wondered how the, how we're doing towards, uh, getting towards the body cameras. I know we're, we've got a couple chosen and we're testing them. I wondered if you could sort of give us an idea of the timetable. Well, uh, as far as the body camera is concerned, I think we're uh, pretty close to identifying a, a product and trying to see if we can get that product uh, delivered. Hopefully, uh, beginning January, we should be able to outfit uh, a good portion of the police department 
uh, with body cameras and then move forward in that endeavor. Uh, the challenges, of course, deal with the ever-changing uh, you know, electronics, mm -hmm. uh, the products, and also uh, the backdoor area there as far as trying to store, things of that nature. Yeah. What we're trying not to do is make costly mistakes that other police departments have. Mm -hmm. and we also want to make sure that whatever product we choose, we can be with that product for years to come because even one of the products that we were uh, looking at earlier in the year that we were testing, that company sold out to another company and that happened within the span of three months. So unlike other police departments that maybe uh, rushed into it, we're looking to make sure that whatever we put out there is something that's gonna last for a while and that's pretty much has been my philosophy for the eight years that I've been here. It may be a little slower, but it turns out to be a lot more right. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to that, and thank you for being so diligent about making the right choice. Um, could you comment a little more about the increase in the priority one calls? I mean, to what, what do you, how do you account for that? That's a huge increase. Well, and aside from I, the I, fact actually, that people are yeah. feeling more comfortable calling us, which uh -huh. is the positive side of it, mm -hmm. I just think that more things that are, are occurring. I'm just glad that when there are shots fired in the community, that people are more apt. Uh, to uh -huh. give a call, and also that they trust this police department enough to, uh, to bring their concerns to them. I think that's increasing. And then if you look at the fact that our population is growing yeah. uh, here in the city, mm -hmm. and not only our population as far as residents are concerned, but our traveling population, both uh, coming to the city to enjoy the city as they should, and also working in the city and doing business in the city. All that's been really increasing uh, greatly and uh, so that's why we've had to address all these issues that come with that. And the, um, do you have any more comments on the aggravated assaults? I mean, we, we've seen such a huge increase in the last year, really, and wondered if you have any more observations to make about that, because that really is driving a lot of our increase. I think that uh, we need to get a lot more uh, individuals in the community who are aware of not only who's involved in violence, but also who's uh, selling, who's maintaining, who's loaning, who has firearms, especially teens with firearms, they really need to uh, start collaborating with the police department and getting us that information. And we have so many venues by which to do it that individuals don't have to be scared about being discovered. I appreciated your remarks also. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate your remarks about the staffing levels. Um, we read the watch reports and uh, I, I, I see the you know the percentage of the percentages by which we're down many times and uh, I know that uh, you all are working on that and I know the city manager is working on that and I appreciate that y'all are working with a consultant and I'm looking forward to hearing the results of that well when when common sense is enough you hire a consultant <laughs> okay um, well hopefully uh, one of those two things will prevail um, I appreciated also the, um, the, as I always do in these reports, the descriptions of the solutions to crime, uh, the, uh, the homicides that were solved, the robberies and so forth, the individual cases that you add uh, into this report. And it's, it's good to, I think it's important to read the good work of the individual officers. And also the, I noted the, uh, the digital forensic units uh, recent accreditation and kind of uniqueness of their accreditation. I wanted to also commend them and and uh, and commend you for that. Um, so I think that's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you and thank you, Chief, for your good work. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening, Chief. Thanks for that report and thank you for your service to the city. As usual, I am concerned about our children, uh, our youth, and in particular uh, the Lakeview School and how effective. You think that it, or do you have any opinion on Lakeview? I don't work for the I don't work for the uh, public schools, so well, I, my the opinion. The reason I asked you that is because I see police officers there, and I thought maybe. Well, a lot of the schools have police officers uh, that are hired by the school system uh, in order to maintain security. Uh, at the schools, so that might be what you see. Mm -hmm. But also we have police officers who go there in order to mentor some of those young uh, men and women who, quite frankly, do need a role model of sorts in order to set their lives back on track. Mm -hmm. I do think that we need to start looking at uh, options and other ways to, uh, to ensure that these individuals get a, uh, 
get an education, uh, and if they cannot uh, navigate through life, that we at least put them in a place where they can navigate through life and then go back to uh, getting the education instead of putting them in one place where all it does is uh, indicate to everybody else in the community that they were in trouble at some point in time, and you know, it kind of stigmatizes them. It does, and that's why I've adopted that school, and that's the reason that I wanted to find out exactly what involvement the police department has. Well, there. you need to get the but involvement of say, the professionals in the city. Say yeah, mentoring. Mentoring is that's is a big. They need to see that uh, that you can make it, and you need to also come in with a lot of boxes of hope because many of them are lacking that. Mm -hmm. And if you can bring in hope through different individuals, different people, and letting them see what life could be, maybe it might be a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring in food, too. Because Food's many good. of them are hungry. And, and clothing and um, different resources. Thank you very much. That's Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you for the report, Chief. I also wanted to um, highlight the digital forensic unit certification and that Durham's first in the country. I think that's a really great achievement. And um, also want to congratulate again all the officers that um, received special recognition or awards at the end of the report. I really like reading those stories. And um, lastly, want to thank you for your service and leadership. Thanks. Chief, I, I um, would echo the comments that my <coughs> colleagues have made in terms of what the police do and we understand they have a have a tough job and uh, some things stand out I too read read the watch reports uh, but I want to congratulate those two officers that apprehended those two young men uh, this morning uh, yesterday and that, that to me was really great police work and uh, I hope you pass along our congratulations for that <coughs> uh, let me ask you a couple of questions and one Steve sort of alluded to but you, you raised the point uh, these numbers are numbers of what they are they're, they're the in individual numbers uh, as compared to last year I understand it, it will also be helpful to see these numbers per hundred thousand I'm sorry uh, it would good to also see these numbers per hundred thousand our population has changed it has grown we're now the fourth largest city in the state of North Carolina and if we look at the indexes from 2001 when I first came in office to at least in 2013 those numbers had gone down per 100,000 in all cases. I know we've had a terrific hit this year and last year, but it's, it's still be comfortable to know how does this measure per 100,000 individuals in our city. So if you can get that to us, uh, maybe in other reports, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, could, could you, just for the public's sake, could you explain what is priority one calls? What falls under that? Priority one. Well, I, I guess I'm trying to get to your the point about your response. Uh, priority one response would be an emergency response. We would need to have an office there as soon as possible, either because someone's on premise or because someone's in, injured to the point of where they need some medical assistance. So that that's the six okay. hundred six thousand plus type calls that you had. Yes, okay. they would em engage right. those types of different crimes. Something in progress. Now, how, how, do you, how do you take in consideration when you get, receive a call and you're having a change of staff? Does that, does that impact your response? I, I rely on uh, Jim Sukup to uh, staff to put these calls together as far as their priorities are concerned. But the response depends on whether I have a police officer to send. Fortunately, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the vehicle identifiers where we would know where the, where the units are and we can dispatch the closest ones to them. But even with that, you have to have a unit available. Well, I, I guess I'm trying to respond to current concerns that I've gotten, and I too happen to be one of those that made the concern. Whereas we called, you had a false alarm, a burglar alarm go off, and the police gets the call and they don't show up until 30 minutes later. And then what I hear is, well, they call around 6 o'clock when the staff is changing over. Does, does that get reflected in any of these priority one calls also? That would impact. Uh, shift change would impact. We're trying to see if we can have enough staffing in order to be able to put some officers to kind of overlap that period of time. But that does impact. Well, I, I've heard that a lot, and it happened to me. And that was the explanation that 
the, we had to change the staff, so we had to wait till somebody got a car before they could come out and respond. Mine was minor because it was a false alarm, but I'm just wondering if it had been one of these prior to one calls that you talked about, would they still have been faced with the same situation? If it's a priority call and it's a, an alarm, you're going to have to send two individuals uh, to that call, and it does turn into a priority. But it also, like I said, depends on where the officers are and who's available at the time. And then also the priorities start to get stacked as far as one might be more important than the other. If we have in a situation where we do definitely know that there's somebody on a property or there's somebody that's injured that needs to be addressed by a police officer, then we need to go to that first. Well, I, I guess this is... To the, to the city manager, but it also, we, we're doing the staffing analysis now. And yes. I would ask them to take that in consideration mm -hmm. when they start looking, do we have enough staff to respond to different type of calls that we have. Uh, I'll start to recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you again, as all my colleagues have said, uh, for your service. Um, we all are greatly concerned about the horrific shootings that we saw in France. Uh, and without giving away any kind of um, uh, priority information, um, can you assure the citizens of Durham that our police department is plugged into the networks that are available so that we can um, have proactive stances to avoid any kind of thing like that here in Durham? Well, I can assure you, you have one of the best police departments here in the state of North Carolina and that uh, they are connected to uh, not just best practices, but also through our federal partners and task forces to just about everything that's possibly out there that any other city would have. We also have networking with other cities and looking into it. Uh, just years back, uh, we were part of a, uh, assisting the FBI in addressing a terrorist issue that had occurred in this vicinity, and we made uh, arrests in response to it. There have been quite a few in the area that the Durham Police Department has been part of the investigation and part of the solution as far as uh, addressing some of those issues in partnership with federal agencies. So yes, I can say you don't have to worry as far as your police department's concerned. You're as safe or safer than most in this, in this country. Okay, well, again, we appreciate uh, what you've done and what you'll continue to do during your remaining time in office and wish you the best. Thank okay. you. Thank you. The general business agenda public hearings. Item 9 is FY 2016-2017 Annual Action Plan. Greetings, Mayor Bell, uh, members of City Council. This is the first of two uh, public hearings that uh, the City of Durham will have concerning the uh, needs of the City of Durham as it relates to our entitlement jurisdiction, uh, the funds received as an entitlement jurisdiction. I'll turn it over to Ms. Wilma Conyers, the Federal Programs Coordinator, to uh, have the particulars uh, in, input into the record. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of Council, Wilma Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator. The purpose of this public meeting is to receive citizen comment on the community development needs in Durham neighborhoods as it relates to the use and receipt of Community Development Block Grant, known as CDBG, the Home Investment Partnership, known as HOME, the Emergency Solutions Grant, referred to as ESG, and our Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS, referred to as HOPWA. This public hearing is a requirement for the preparation and submission of the City's FY16 17 Annual Action Plan. Notice of this meeting was advertised in the Herald Sun, the Carolina Times, and the Kpasa newspapers, as well as via a general listserv and the department's website. As a recipient of CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings prior to the submission of the Annual Action Plan. The first meeting must be held early in development of the plan, and we anticipate that the second meeting will be held approximately late April. 
In addition, the city is required to publish a copy of the draft annual action plan for at least 30 days prior to the submission to HUD. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has not yet announced the FY 2016 entitlement allocations and has advised grantees not to submit their consolidated plans or their annual action plans until the final formula allocations have been announced. The city's annual action plan must be submitted to HUD by May 15th. However, for planning purposes, the city expects to receive approximately $1,807,500 in CDBG, $776,000 in home, approximately $160,000 in ESG, and $282,000 in HOPWA funds. A summary of the comments from this public hearing and written comments received from citizens during the development of the annual action plan will be incorporated into the final 2016 plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me first ask are there questions by members of the council. We have uh, 15 persons that have signed up to speak on this item. <clears throat> is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that has not filled out one of the yellow cards? Uh, if so, I would ask you to go to the table to the left. I'm trying to determine how much time we allocate for this item. Okay, let, let's do it this way. Uh, each person has three minutes. And as I call your name, if you come to the right to the podium, uh, there's a clock in front of you that will keep, in, indicate the time. Uh, Asian M. Isrik, Isrik, um, I can't pronounce it, I can't read it really. Okay, thank you. If you. And again, when you come to the podium, if you announce your name and address, that would be helpful. Janice Johnson, is Janice Johnson present? Janice Johnson? Uh, Michael T. Wilson, is Michael T. Wilson present? Uh, Jimmy Gibbs, Jimmy Gibbs. Cheryl Smith, I saw Cheryl. Joy Mickle, let's see Joy, okay. James Chavis, I saw James. Uh, Jim Svara, I saw Jim. Deborah West, is Deborah West present? Deborah West. Uh, Debbie Case, no, Debbie White. Uh, Marion Spicer. Michael Hudson, Gwendolyn Hudson, Chambers, Edith Thompson, Tanya Hall. Now, is anyone present whose name I did not call that wishes to speak on this item? Uh, if I did not call your name, if you go to the, no, you can, if, if you have the card, that's fine. Thank you. That's uh, Aria, Aria Sands Bell. Um, so she will be the last speaker. Come forward, please. Again, if you just state your name and address for the record. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, my name is Awesome Insurer. I live at 308 Dunstan Avenue here in Durham. I live uh, just three blocks north of North Carolina Central University. I, I consider it a low income neighborhood. There's a great need in our neighborhood for um, maintenance and repair of housing. Many of the people in my neighborhood own their own homes, but they can't afford to maintain and repair them. And I wish that we would use uh, community development black grant money to provide loans and grants uh, to people so that we can maintain our properties, and that would be a great help in stabilizing our neighborhoods. We appreciate uh, what's been done in Southside. You know, uh, one development changes an area, but I hope that you won't forget that homeowners also have an investment. Homeowners also can uh, stabilize and, and support a neighborhood, and I wish that we would pr increase the amount of dollars that we give for loans and grants and possibly even eliminate the, the income level. Uh, some, some people have good incomes, but we're still struggling with mortgage. And so to have an income level, I think you have three categories, income, age, and possibly handicapped to qualify 
for the emergency loan grant program. I'm sure that other people here are more informed than I am. I just heard about this meeting tonight. But I simply want to uh, express my opinion, living in a neighborhood that really needs uh, funding, loans and grants would be greatly appreciate, uh, be appreciated to help us stabilize our neighborhoods. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Janice Johnson. Good evening. I, um, as you know, the Janice, my name is Janice Johnson. I live at uh, 1230 Willowdale Drive, uh, which is uh, in the same community that uh, the organization that I represent or uh, at one time worked for and volunteer for now, uh, the AIDS Community Resident Association, uh, sometimes known as ACRA. Uh, ACRA uh, is over 25 years old and uh, has worked to provide affordable housing for people who are living with HIV and AIDS. Um, during that time, uh, over these years, we have uh, constructed two facilities, which are operating now. Uh, another one, we were able to get some funds to rehab, and uh, it is presently closed because it is in greatly in need of uh, uh, additional work to get people back in it. Um, affordable housing is so key for people who are living with disabilities, particularly HIV and AIDS. I think a lot of people feel that uh, there's not as great a need because people are living longer, but there's a great need. Their incomes just, they don't have the income to support the uh, rents that are charged in the city, uh, and they need more affordable housing. We cannot afford to keep the housing up. Uh, we are in a, a, a real pinch when it comes to rehabbing the current housing that we have. And the monies that have been appropriated under HOPWA, $282,000 is just not adequate. It does very little to do any repairs when you are trying to upgrade, upgrade um, appliances, the facilities themselves. Um, our housing, um, right now we've got uh, 14 apartment units that have been operating since 1992, and a group home for six individuals. We hope to get the other one, the other facility uh, up and running when we have adequate funds. We don't have them. And uh, somehow, we need someone other than the small amounts that are being appropriated through the government to help us to get these, this housing in, uh, in place so that people uh, with the disabilities that we work with can have safe, affordable housing. Thank you. Welcome. Michael Wilson. Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Wilson. I'm one of the residents in one of the housing developments that Ms. Johnson spoke about. Um, I'm fortunate, like everything she said was absolutely true. We, um, I, um, I've been there for a year. I, I live in the one for a, for the, for a year now, and we do have a lot of disparities of not having adequate maintenance services and stuff like that. And it took me a while actually to get the get the housing. I thought that was kind of odd because I've been here for almost eight years, and I have to, my, I was living check to check, and I really didn't have no money. To actually live here, and I was actually deciding to move until actually I did obtain the housing for myself, and it was very, it's helpful. But then I'm still in a little bit of a struggle, and then if they can't upkeep the apartments, it, it's not safe for me to be there. And the area is a nice area, but it, it's not, you know, we're not up to standards. Um, and I thought I was moving somewhere to better my, to make it better for me. I am a. Um, I'm really grateful. I'm a 29-year HIV survivor, and I'm doing well. But I can be doing better for myself. And I tell everybody, we just have to hold on. We rely on you all to support us and helping us to, to make it better for us. I, I, I keep myself active so I don't get so depressed about some things that we cannot do or we cannot help. We have no control over because. We can't do so much on our complex. We want to do more. There's other people that want to come out, but they can't because they, they're, they're not feeling well. 
we have small projects like we need stuff to be maintenance work to be done inside the apartments let alone on the outside but i mean if we don't have no funding and i looked at the funding dollar amount i said well that's not even enough to even to restore the, the two empty apartments that we have to, to give some us some housing i mean we i mean i mean we just really 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 need the help of you all to look over look with the dollar amount and then reassess what we asking for you know just you know it's really it's a hard task i mean i'm um, i do a lot of work for nhiv in the community and it's just like i come home i want to come to a nice place i want to be comfortable and i want everybody else to be happy around me i give out a good impression because i'm a survivor and i can tell people that it's not we all believe in we all have hope and that we're going to get better for us and for us to stay here in the city we don't want to have to go to live no one else. We want to stay right here in Durham. I've been here for eight, my eight years I've been here, I was debating, excuse me, I was debating on staying or not, but I did decide to stay because of the fact that the opportunities were for, going to be there for me, but now it just seemed like I'm going back to where I started at when I first got here. But I would appreciate y'all just taking another look at what you're offering for us and uh, maybe you can just take over the view of what we can assess for us and get that, keep our developments going because we do have very limited housing for people with HIV in this community. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Jimmy Gibbs. Good evening, everybody. It's good to be back in Durham. Um, as a fifth year president of ACRA, the AIDS Community Residents Association, we do have a little known fact. Um, our Fitz Powell apartments were the first apartments built in 1992, funded by HUD as a 811 project for people living with HIV and AIDS between the nation's capital and Florida. And that has a lot to do with the determination of and the resolve of the people of Durham, North Carolina. If it were not for Patricia P Bartlett and Gretchen Durham and those folks that have put forth a lot of effort, we would not have these apartments today. If it were not for the speaker before me, Janice Johnson, and her resolve, we would not have the HUD 811 on the other end of Cook Road. Uh, that's a $500,000 $500, uh, group home that we have today. It was converted from a 24-hour care facility to a group home because people are living with HIV and AIDS. They're not dying from HIV and AIDS, as you can hear from Michael. And the need for housing is important. The need for housing is greater than actually the supportive services. People need a home to stay in. And the allocated amounts that HAPWA is bringing into our community is just not enough uh, to provide that housing. The subsidized housing rents that we have um, for our properties that we're trying to make sure that people have the right maintenance on their apartments, that we get the right subsidized rents for, and that we're able to maintain them is just incredibly, incredibly high for us. I just met with our HUD rep um, yesterday and told her how difficult it is for us to maintain our housing here in Durham because of the rents uh, on these 811 properties. And it's just hard. It's high. It's very expensive to maintain housing. We know how much it is to maintain housing for us uh, at our own homes. So when you look at maintaining uh, 14 units plus a group home, it's very expensive to do it on the HOPWA funds that are available. A lot of it's going to supportive services, but, need, but look at the needs that, um, for housing. We need money for housing. Thank you so much for your consideration and put some more money in there for housing uh, instead of uh, more for supportive services. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, Cheryl Smith. Good evening. My name is Cheryl Smith. I live at 302 North Holman Street, Apartment 2. I'm here on behalf of affordable housing. I've noticed my, um, in my community, Northeast Central Durham, that they're coming in, buying up homes, fixing them up. But after they fix them up, the rent is so high that we can't afford to rent them. 
And a lot of these houses, because they have the rent so high, the still for rent signs is out there. We're getting a lot of homeless children. When I was at, I mean, you can go, when the school get out, go to the motels. You see all these children getting off the bus at motels. We have families that's working two and three jobs and still can't afford to pay rent. And this guy to the point now, you have to have make at least three times the amount of the rent in order to rent anything. And I mean, I had an opportunity to move um, this spring, but I didn't want to leave Northeast Central Durham. Everything that I seen that they um, that was bought and fixed up, it was too high. Everything 1,200 and up. What happened to affordable housing? That's not affordable. Some of us live from paycheck to paycheck. Some people live off disability. I mean, it's it's getting ridiculous. Usually, you can find a house in Northeast Central Durham for six, seven, and eight hundred dollars. You can't do that anymore. They buying the houses. They going to the um, owners, asking to buy their houses. And then the people that's living in the houses have to move. And then it's been so hard to find anything that they can afford, so they have to move into motels. Or they have to move way out by Southern High School. I mean, even, I even got a Section 8 voucher this summer and couldn't even find anything. So I chose to stay where I was at. I mean, it almost seemed like nobody wants to deal with Section 8 anymore. Se Section 8 is a waste of time. We have a lot of landlords, a lot of realtors, but nobody wants to take Section 8. They make the vouchers high, or they make the rent higher than the vouchers. And then when you find somewhere, it's somewhere you don't want to live, or the houses shouldn't even pass inspection from housing authority. I mean, things need to change. We need to help save our children. If our kids are homeless, they're going to be in the streets. They're going to commit crimes. And we need to, come, we need to help our children. The kids are suffering. Parents are, parents are getting tired and giving up. So I'm here to ask you to please just think about the children. Thank you. Joy Mickle. Good evening. <clears throat> Joy Mickle, 3111 Ivywood Lane. Um, I'm a part of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, and today we agreed and uh, uh, approved a letter that I'd like to read uh, to you about affordable housing. Uh, dear City Council and County Commission, we do plan to send this to them as well. Affordable housing in Durham is a critical issue that we as a community must deal with in a serious and comprehensive way sooner than later, sooner rather than later. We appreciate all that has been done by the Council and Commission to honor the voices that have raised awareness of the issue and continued housing affordability in Durham. We think that a meaningful conversation about how best to include affordable slash workforce housing around transit has to include the management and disposition of publicly owned land in and around targeted transit stations in Durham. We propose that there be a policy created that will help with the long-term affordability of housing through using publicly owned sites for real estate development, including commercial and mixed-use development projects. The policy should ensure that any disposition or development of publicly owned land near transit stations includes some provision for affordable housing. This policy would help implement the city and county affordable housing goal of creating and preserving at least 15% affordable homes around each transit station. We propose that the city council and county commission adopt such a policy and develop a set of guidelines applicable to the disposition of publicly owned land. We believe that this will ensure that critical attention will be given to the severe need to build and maintain affordable housing near transit in Durham. We can, as a community, ensure that accessibility to housing for all income groups will be expanded as publicly owned land is developed going forward. Sincerely, the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. Thank you. Next is James Chavis. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. My name is James Chavis, 2813 Ash Street, Apartment B. In the last year, 13 new homes has been built in our area. But I wonder, do you think that building new homes beside rundown rental property is a good investment? But guess what? The people that's living in these rundown houses paying rent that's going up ridiculously because there is no rent set. 
But guess what? Out of these 13 new homes that was built, not one of them are East Durham residents. No one is really looking at the people in the area when they come and build. I asked them, go and ask the neighbor next door when you build that house that you're going to go across and build another home. Ask some of them around there, do they would like to become homeowners? Show them how to become homeowners. I talk to people. Yes, we try to get people out. But guess what? We don't have the, the right tools to get them out. We ask them to come to the meetings. We can't get them because the first thing they say is, what? Why should we? What are you really going to give us? I can't give them nothing but some words and encouragement. But you all can come out there. How many have you been out there? We need this money that's been set aside to come out into the community for people that really need affordable living, not to the expensive owners and others. We need you all to make sure that affordability, please determine what is affordable. Is $18,000 some of those apartments downtown affordable? $12,000 some of them affordable? Now coming on our area, nine to $1,200 for a one bedroom, is that affordable? Please determine what is affordable when you get ready to spend this grant money. Thank you. Welcome, Jim. Jim Savara. Thanks, James. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Savari. I live at 1114 uh, Woodburn Road, uh, and I am a member of the a Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. Uh, looking through the consolidated plan, uh, it provides further documentation that the paramount housing need in Durham is for affordable housing. We've had previous estimates of 14 to 19,000 units needed. The consolidated plan estimates that 20% of all households are paying over 30% of their income for, uh, for housing. That's 18,000. And 16%, almost 15,000, are paying over 50% of their income for housing. The plan itself, as opposed to the careful analysis of needs, focuses to some extent on homelessness, on persons housing for persons with AIDS, but it devotes a great deal of the resources to completing the long-standing commitment to revitalizing Southside. Through 2019, the plan provides for only 100 new affordable housing units all in Southside. Thus, the consolidated plan is not an affordable housing plan and it does not address the whole city. That's nothing new. We've been dealing with that for some time. Uh, although it identifies needs, the response will need to come in other programs and use other resources, and it will take the creative response of the city council and, and the people and organizations throughout the city. Uh, we look forward to the additional analysis and proposed action plan that will be coming from the report that Karen Lotto is doing, uh, and then we will really need to get down, down to work. Uh, the uh, one, other, one other minor point, or one other point with regard to the homeless dimension in the study. Uh, using the American Community Survey, the, the study identifies the number of units that are overcrowded. Uh, I, a good friend uh, and, and a perceptive colleague, uh, Bro Ray Earhart, has, has pointed out that we have three categories of homeless people, the unsheltered, the sheltered, and the doubled up, that is people who are living in other households. Uh, and it's possible that a more detailed in-depth analysis of those survey results might be able to identify the, the extent of that doubled up need. Thank you. Uh, Deborah West. Yes, um, mm, um, I am a former tenant that lived in housing as well, particularly Fish Power, and um, there was a lot of repairs that needed to be done, and I lived there paying my rent faithfully for about 10 years or more, um, and 
and they need to really work on some stuff. Now I'm living in a one bedroom and I'm paying a lot of rent, can barely meet the bills because landlords don't want to do nothing. Um, the property is not the best. I have a driveway, it's all chopped up. People don't even want to pull up in the, in the driveway or anything. It would be good if we could see more funds and the landlord have more consideration. And also one thing I want to say about Fish Power Apartments, yes, they charge tenants 30% of the rent. But what they do not tell you is that you have to pay your electric bill. They give you 20% to, towards your electric bill, but when the winter comes, your bill is so high that you don't spend that 20% that you're supposed to save and more on that. Um, there are housing out there where everything is included and you just pay that one straight price. But when you have to pay the rent plus the electric bill, it's like why I'm where I'm at now. Why pay all that when you can just live in regular housing? But it is very, very hard for me to have to pay the rent that I have to pay and my electric bills and maintain everything else to keep it functioning. So if y'all can help out in that area, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Debbie White. Excuse me. I, I was calling Debbie White. You were Miss West, oh. right? Yes. Okay. De <laughs> Debbie White. A lot of Debbies tonight. Good evening. My name is Debbie White. I live at 60 Citation Drive in Durham, and I'm the financial officer for CASA. And I'm here to speak tonight about the need for developing additional permanent supportive housing in the city of Durham. CASA is a nonprofit uh, developer and manager of permanent rental housing for low income households, particularly focused on people with disabilities and veterans. These are households who live on income well below the poverty level. CASA's typical tenant is living on disability income and earning less than $10,000 a year. Beyond income, our tenants face barriers to finding quality affordable housing barriers such as poor credit, poor rental histories, needing funds for utility deposits, renter insurance requirements, housing discrimination, and zero tolerance eviction policies. CASA currently owns 44 apartments in Durham and there are 243 Durham County households on our waiting list. Two thirds of these families and individuals are currently homeless. The rest are either in substandard housing, temporary housing, or renting but paying more than they can afford. 11 people moved out in 2014. At the current rate of turnover and with our existing inventory, it would take 22 years to house everyone on our waiting list. The need just keeps growing. More housing is the solution and we are actively looking to acquire land and buildings to expand our Durham inventory so we can make more units available to those who need them. Uh, the approach CASA takes to ending and preventing homelessness is permanent supportive housing. It's a proven best practice. It works not only to permanent to end, it works not only permanently to end an individual's homelessness, but to decrease the cost to communities of constantly managing that individual's homelessness through temporary interventions like emergency shelter stays and hospital visits. CASA's experience supports national data trends that show that 85 to 90 percent of tenants placed in supportive housing stay in that housing at least one year. And once a tenant stays for a year, they are less likely to return to homelessness as long as their housing remains safe and affordable. Supportive housing works by addressing the barriers mentioned above and by offering tenants the option to work with service providers in the community, allowing them to learn to live independently and retain their housing. While services are optional, in CASA units, the vast majority of our tenants engage in services because they see the value of having strong support. And CASA service provider partners in Durham include Alliance Behavioral Health, Housing for New Hope, Healing with Care, and the HUD VA Medical Center. We ask the City Council to prioritize the CDBG and home funds 
to serve people who need housing the most, people who are experiencing homelessness, and people with disabilities who are low income. It's a wise investment in people and in housing for all members of our community. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Marion Spicer. Is Marion Spicer? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and everyone else on the podium. I've talked about this before. I am a Section 8 voucher holder. Um, my name is Marion Spicer. I work at Club Boulevard School. I'm an instructional assistant. We don't really get paid enough for me to just pay my rent, so that's why I have a voucher. And um, one day I went home and I found out that I had to move, and that's because the landlords and Fox Fire decided to put everyone out that was on Section 8. So I have been looking now for maybe two months for an apartment, a one-bedroom, which no one's renting to us. Um, so it's been less than a week. I was told that I can get a two-bedroom for a one-bedroom voucher. Okay, so I'm still looking. Um, there's so many other people that need this help rather than just me. You know, I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but I appreciate someone giving me that choice to let me get a two-bedroom for a one-bedroom because I've been looking for a long time. Um, I hope that you will make housing a little more affordable for people. I would love to live downtown, but we can't afford to. They would not take Section 8 anywhere downtown, but Main Street. Um, condos and then there's a lot going with that I still can't get in there I've been on the waiting list for like three years I can't get in there because you have to have a second person on your lease so I'm still I'm single so I and by doing that housing authority is not going to accept that you know I haven't heard that they would accept it but I just hope that we will get more help more housing more landlords to rent to us. And I'm staying with my niece right now, sometimes. I stay there most of the day, Latanya Gilchrist, they just went up on her rent. And she has a voucher. I don't understand why they go up on people's rent when they have a voucher. I mean, they know we can't afford it. Do they want to just keep us in poverty? So would you please just think about us? Because I'm really how homeless if my daughter and my niece would not let me come and stay. So please, thank you. Excuse well, me, can you give us your address and the name of your landlord? Former right. landlord. From the landlord? Mm -hmm. Fox Fire Apartments, where I lived, or now? now? Where you lived previously. That's where I lived, Fox Fire Apartments. Okay. Um, and the name of the landlord? Uh, a company that manages it. All I know is Fox Fire Apartment, they change management. So I really don't know. I just know I received a note on my door, she said, but I didn't get the note. That was kind of upsetting also. I didn't even get the note on my door. I said, why would you put an important notice like that on my door? And I wasn't even home. I was out of town taking care of my sick sister. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael Hudson. I know, uh, Mayor, uh, City Council members. Um, I guess I have a little different approach. Um, I am a, a house, I own a house, me, my brother and sister. And I worked for the city of Durham in 2002. I got hurt from, from 2002. And ever since then, I, I couldn't get a job from anywhere because my injury was never fixed. And so I had to end up start working for myself. Then I got in another situation, got bit by a spider. So um, I was not able to get a job, so I started working for myself. Okay, anyway. Um, how Durham supposed to help people, but instead of helping them, it seemed like they 
put more pressure on them. I've been sick for the ever since 2002. Um, pushed into work, making me have to work, having to get out there no matter what, you know. And, and if you're going to do right, you're going to, you know, going to do right and get a job, do some kind of work to make money. But the city is supposed to help you. And instead of helping you, okay, say taxes. Um, if you have trouble paying $1,000 taxes, how are you gonna put $6,000 on you? I mean, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. If not, if anything, I, I can see they ought to have some type of program to help people that run into medical problems that, you know, can't um, be able to, you know, not be able to get a job or have some type of difficulties and help them rather than hurt them because it seems like, you know, some people, they having trouble just getting houses. When you got a house and then they take it from you, that ain't no better. I mean, you, you're supposed to be able to, I, I, people forgot where, I guess, um, when, it, when we was taught in school and in church and, and from, our, from my parents, that, you know, you're supposed to look out for each other, you're supposed to, you know, make sure, you know, you get a job, don't do nothing wrong, you know, out there in the streets, because you're gonna, anything that you do is gonna come back and hunt you. So, we was taught to get out and, you know, make an effort to make money and make it the right way. Well, you can do that, but if something happens and you get sick, it ought to be something that the city can do to help you keep things going until you can get back on track and help you be able to, I mean, help people. I mean, it's no, uh, it, it's like nobody love nobody no more. You know, nobody have no concern about nobody. Everybody is about money. And it shouldn't be about money, it should be about people. People should be able to help each other. I mean, and they come and take all the communities, tear down houses that they could fix up and fix for people, even if the city take them over. The city could take the houses and fix the houses for people and give them low income, you know, five, six hundred dollars a month. But instead of that, they tear the houses down and then build these, meet these 20, these hundred dollar houses. But uh, anyway, that, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Gwendolyn Hudson Chambers. Good afternoon, yeah. um, Mayor, and the rest of the city council and ladies. Um, I am here because I received a bill from Neighborhood Improvement for $5,250 on a house that I have been working on for the last two years trying to get in shape, but I can't get it in shape because the vagrants come in and do what they want to do with it. And it's boarded up. It has no trespassing signs on it but they do exactly what they want to do. I've uh, put somewhere around $30,000, $40,000 in the house. Then I had um, furniture in it. I had um, appliances. They went in and they took everything out, everything they wanted, including the pipes, the water pipes, and the um, copper pipes for the heat, heating system. Now the city of Durham wants to take this. I've been in Durham 65 years today, today. Never left the city of Durham. Never turned my back on Durham because I was born. I am a native Durhamite. Been here all my life. And the way this city has treated my family for the last 47 years, and it's been coming, I mean steadily, 47 years. The neighbors started it on both sides and they kept right on coming. They wouldn't let up. They still won't let up. And neighborhood improvement has taken sides and they are just doing an injustice to me. I need to talk to someone who can help me. I've been sick this whole weekend, but I need to talk to someone because I, I don't usually let things bother me because I know who can help me. But this has truly gotten me down because it's not fair. Can I have an appointment with someone who knows what's going on in this city and can help me? I think I've been here 65 years. I, I, I owe something. Ms. Uh, Chambers. Chambers. Chambers, I want to make sure I had your name correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the city manager has taken note of your comments. Thank city you. Manager, and I assume that you'll get in touch with her. Thank you. Good game. What's the address? My address is 2923 South Roxborough Street. The addresses that I'm concerned about, 708 Colfax Street and 1003 Gillette Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Edith Thompson. Good evening. My remarks were set for five minutes because I thought we had five, but I'll try to go through you have, you have real three. quickly just to stay in context with your instructions. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on behalf of Rebuild Durham's leadership. We want to commend the leadership of the city of Durham in making Durham a destination of choice for individuals and businesses seeking the great quality of life that we offer and the economic opportunities that have now become available in Durham. We understand the goals of mixed income, high density, and accessible transportation for cities with tremendous growth potential. We also recognize the need to stretch limited resources to address as many community needs as, and priorities as possible. Uh, therefore, we are here this evening not to ask for already strained city resources, but to thank the city leadership and the Department of Community Development for the opportunity that you gave Rebuild Durham to reinvest our rental income back into the properties that we own for management and maintenance and improvements, ensuring a continued supply of quality, safe, and affordable rental housing for approximately 30 families over the last couple of years. Rebuild Durham's a nonprofit affordable rental homes program that provides some an opportunity to save while they prepare to become homeowners, seniors and disabled people, stable long-term rentals, and families who have lost their housing equity in the disproportionate impact of the foreclosure crisis to get back on track. We are certain Rebuild Durham homes are part of the solution to decreasing the displacement of low-income residents who are getting priced out of our growing local housing market. We strive to counter the impact of absentee landlords and negative property owners and corporate investors who see our neighborhoods as only low-investment, high-yield assets and whose commitment is tied to profit and not people. Rebuild Durham homes are managed by local conscientious property management professionals that take pride in stable communities. As for the demand for housing near downtown continues to expand, we are hopeful that historic African American neighborhoods will not suffer from unintended neglect and or planned encroachment. Rebuild Durham looks forward to a continued partnership with the city in identifying and leveraging new financial resources to address the problems we face in communities that, we in, that are impacted by historic disinvestment. In closing, we would like to thank the housing chair on the mayor's chairs on the mayor's poverty reduction task force for supporting our upcoming housing conference scheduled for January the 9th. We look forward to working with you to preserve Durham neighborhoods and find solutions to some of the problems that we are confronting. I thank you. You're welcome. Tanya Hall. Thank you. Good evening, Durham citizens, city council members, Mayor Bell. My name is Tanya Hall, and I have lived in Durham off and on for the past 20 years. I first came to Durham in 1986 to attend NCCU. It was then that I fell in love with this city. I tell my students of Durham's rich black history and heritage and how proud I am of the decision to stay here and raise my children. I graduated from Coppin State College in Baltimore, Maryland in 1991, did a Master of Arts in Literature at the University of Maryland College Park, and I hold a Master of Science in Criminal Justice from North Carolina Central University. 
I am a teacher and instructor, a professor. I spent seven years, six years at NCCU in the Department of Criminal Justice, 20, 2007 to 2013. Adjunct professor at St. Augustine's College, I am currently a substitute teacher for the Durham Public School System, and I work at Durham Technical Community College part-time. Um, I'm also a mother of 12-year-old sons, Malik and Keenan Kane, who are in the sixth grade at Central Park School for Children. I want to publicly state that the safe and affordable housing for low-income citizens is almost non-existent. There must be greater choice for safe and affordable housing for families like mine and individuals that are struggling to pay extremely high rents in neighborhoods all over Durham. I moved from a single family home in, two, in Northeast Central Durham to Amberlynn Valley off Ivywood Lane. I lived there three years after my townhouse was burglarized. I moved into Grove Park neighborhood off 98 when my rent went from $12.50 a month to $1,400 and I was no longer employed full time. I had no choice but to move. The struggle to find affordable housing for my sons and I in Durham was unbelievable. I was approaching homelessness, mostly due to the fact that I had two part-time jobs and they didn't consider that to be enough. I, I didn't make, four, I wasn't 40 hours and it wasn't enough to cover three times the rent. And I'm pretty educated and I make a good wage. I have a number of students that would also be considered homeless but due to their age and their non-parental status, they were unable to meet certain criteria for housing programs here. We need your help. We need your help. Housing is a basic right. Thank you. You're welcome. Aurelia Sands Bell. Someone signed up for you, right? <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Bell, and to our council. I'm accompanied tonight by Alma Davis, our Director of Shelter Services, and we represent the Durham Crisis Response Center. And I want to start out by thanking the council for its um, unwavering support of victims of domestic violence in our community. I was thinking tonight that um, I w want to share with you that the number one request that our agency receives for assistance is emergency shelter. We are in our community and for the size, and I listened at the mayor as he asked for statistics. We, for our community of size, have only 18 beds. And for the size of our community, we at least need to have a double of that. The number one reason for our clients when they leave here, who often return to their batterers, who often return to violence, who often return to situations that compromise their safety, and the safety of their children is because they have nowhere to live. And so we continue to see the cycle of violence in our community. The funds that are available to us through HUD have been expressed on a federal level. Domestic violence victims are considered a special population. However, Durham Crisis Response Center has not been able to um, participate in that funding resource because of some of the barriers that are centered around regulations and many of the things that I think our COC has um, designed not to hurt us, but it certainly doesn't help us. And we would like to ask the city council tonight if you would help us to encourage our local COC to decrease the barriers that impede safe living for victims of domestic violence and to help us to work with our city uh, staff to ensure that certain um, things that are, I'm sure, requirements that we can get up to speed, but they are ex exhaustive to us. They cost us a lot of money to provide those kind of services uh, because they're administrative dollars of which we have none. So my uh, plea tonight to council would be to help us to come up with a way that an organization that meets the needs of a very special population can participate fully in funding to provide emergency shelter and affordable housing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
let me ask is it anyone else that wants to speak on this item this is a public hearing item and if you haven't had an opportunity to speak now is the time to do that as part of the public record uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak and uh, I guess there may be some comments from council members I, I do have a couple of questions uh, for the staff um, where, where is the staff Uh, we, we've heard uh, in this last comments and I guess throughout the question about barriers and I, I know this is federal dollars so we've got certain guidelines that we have to follow in terms of uh, how we allocate funds for, for different projects. Uh, one thing that struck me, and I, I'm not sure where it, where it, where it comes in, uh, the housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, Hopper. Mm -hmm. I heard comments about money being used ask money to be used for housing. Is this money being used for housing that's being proposed or is it for services? I, I see that the amount you have in is $280,000 and I assume that's for a complete fiscal year, is that correct? That is correct. Now, are any of those dollars for actual housing or is that more for services being provided? At this particular point in time, Mayor, we have an application process that's underway. Uh -huh. And one of the things that's important is we are new entitlement is that the past, what the state has been doing has been services. The state of North Carolina has not been doing uh, any home ownership, any uh, housing. And so one of the things that's very important is poor regulation. We have to have a continuity of service. So one of the things that we're working on as we go through the application process is uh, making sure that we are able to transition because uh, one of the goals that we have is to be able to do housing, but we're not able to do that right now because we have to maintain continuity of service for those people who are currently receiving services uh, through HOPPA as we transition from the state to the uh, city of Durham as the entitlement jurisdiction. Well, I, I'm, I'm, not I'm not speaking about the six-month period. I'm speaking about what's being proposed in this funding budget, which I assume is actually one year, physical year, yes. one year. So within that portion, will you be able to use those dollars for housing or is that still services? It's probably, sir, like I said, we have an application process underway. It's probably going to end up being services, simply because a good portion of that has, is being used for services currently. And we have to transition from, if the, the, the balance of it is, all of it is being used for services, we can't just stop using services because those people uh, are in need of services. Okay, I guess I need to have that discussion offline. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one, one of the other questions that uh, was raised, it's, it's no question that there's a need for affordable housing in this community. I think, you know, any, anybody can see that it's been in time. Well, certainly this council recognizes it. Uh, what what I'm, I'm hoping is that uh, when the consultant comes back with their report, it will give us a better guideline as to how we might consider approaching the issue of affordable housing in this community. But we have to do that in conjunction with the fact that we have federal dollars that requires us to use it for certain ways and be spent according to certain, certain criteria. So I, I hope that uh, that's, that's understood. One way that uh, some of you may be of help as we go through this process is to come back with maybe very specific recommendations as to how you think uh, we might be able to confront the barriers that we have and still accomplish the goals that you're looking for in terms of providing more affordable housing. Uh, I'm just throwing that out. I know we've got a lot of smart people out there, a lot of you spending your time on this, but it would be helpful if you came back to us with some very specific recommendations as to how you think we might be able to use those dollars to provide more affordable housing. And I think we also need to get on board with what affordable housing is. And one of the other things, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Manager and to the staff, I think we need to really understand whose medium income are we speaking about. Are we speaking about the medium income for our MSA? Are we speaking about the medium income for Durham? Uh, I, think, I really think we need to make sure where we are in that. And we just saw a report that says we are the, one of the 20th richest cities in, in the country. But that took into account Chapel Hill, Chatham, and Durham. So, but if we're talking about Durham, we need to make sure we're talking about the income for Durham, not for the MSA. And again, I don't know if that conflicts with the federal guidelines or not, but we do need some, need some clar clarification on that. Well, I, I can speak to that, okay, uh, uh, Mayor. As it relates to HUD funding, we have to use the um, area median income as it relates to the MSA, which does include Chapel Hill and Chatham. 
And the, the, the regulations are clear about that. Well, that, that makes a big difference. And I, if that's the regulations, that's what we have to follow with. And I just hope others understand that also when we start talking about medium income for affordable housing, whose guidelines are we using? If we're using our own dollars, I guess we can do what we want with it. But if we're talking about that's federal right. dollars, then it appears we have to follow the guidelines for the MSA, which puts it a, a lot higher in terms of how it uh, impacts our people. May I do need to uh, co make a correction. It does include Durham and Chapel Hill, not Chatham. Well, whatever it is, we just need to make sure we know wh whose medium income we're mm -hmm. speaking about. Uh, if it's Chapel Hill and Durham, that, mm -hmm. that even makes it even, mm -hmm. even worse. Recognize uh, the mayor approach. Yes, good evening. And we need to look at alternative funding. And I'm hoping that depending for housing uh, requirements are not so stringent that even local money cannot be used to help our people, especially ACRA and um, Durham Crisis Response Center. Uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So we need to look at policy to make sure that we don't have barriers ourselves to helping people. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to appreciate the people that came. It was very moving to hear you. Um, it really was. I mean, a lot of us work on this a whole lot. The council works extremely hard on affordable housing. We think about it all the time. We try to figure it out. And we try to, we try to do our best with the money that we have. But hearing you all tonight really redoubles my interest and in, 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 in commitment to this. And, and I just thought it was a tremendous testimony. Um, a couple of things I want to particularly address. One is the gentleman who spoke first about maintenance and repair. I'm not sure if he's still in the room. Um, I, I agree that that's a, an area where we need to do better. And um, I think that we can help people maintain, maintain living in their homes if we can do that. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, that our, our consultant, who several people have referred to tonight, uh, will help us with a recommendation for that. Uh, and the, um, you know, I was not aware of the situation at ACRA with the, um, with the group home, and so I was appreciative of learning that. Um, it's been a great institution for many years here, and uh, similarly, it was, it was really instructive to hear the level of need from the crisis response center, so thank you. I know, I know there's need, but uh, it was I was appreciative of hearing the specifics. Similarly, from CASA, which I think is one of our very best uh, housing organizations, to hear the need again for permanent supportive housing, which we know. Um, but this is a, this, this, hearing again the expression of this need. I wanted to mention one thing about Section 8, which Ms. Spicer mentioned. And uh, uh, Ms. Spicer and others came uh, to the Durham Housing Authority Board of Directors about 10 days ago and spoke with the Board of Directors and made the case that we ought to be able to offer, that we ought to be able to use our one-bedroom one vou one vouchers for two-bedroom units, uh, which the Housing Authority had not previously done. Um, the, the, after they came, the Housing Authority uh, checked it out with other jurisdictions, thanks to the recommendation of Ms. Spicer and others. And uh, in fact, the Housing Authority is now doing that, a practice which we should have been doing before, but we are now doing. And so I think I want to make that known to the public to make that clear. If you have a one-bedroom voucher, you're now, if you can get a two-bedroom apartment for the same price of that one-bedroom voucher, that's now possible, which previously was not. And so really that was due to people like you coming, making your voices heard, and it had a big effect. And I think it will help many people. That's a short-term solution, however, because as everyone here has, has expressed, the pressure on our housing market is extreme. The great thing is that people want to come to Durham and they want to live here. The downside of that is that they're forcing rents up. Our ability to affect that is limited. That's one of the things I want to say. We can't change that. We're not going to fight the free market and beat it. Supply and demand is an immutable law. But what we can do is we can mitigate the effects, the ill effects of that. Uh, not all of them, but we can make a difference. And we can make a difference in ways you all were talking about. And I think that um, we, are, we have a lot riding, I think, on, on, on uh, Enterprise Community Partners, our consultant. I think they're going to do a great job, and I think they're going to lay out for us what we need to do in terms of in, uh, what the city needs to do and can do, the resources that we're going to need, the money we're going to need to spend, 
and then we need to figure out a way to, to make that happen. So again, uh, I'm really appreciative of you all being here uh, and, uh, and, and hearing such sincere and authentic and, and, um, and real uh, testimony, uh, again, just redoubles my commitment, and I know that my colleagues share this commitment. It's, it's very, very important to us. I wish we could say we had all the answers now and all the money now. We don't. But I know that we will do our best. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Are there other comments? If not, again, we pre appreciate your time. Oh, yeah, Councilman yeah. Brown, let's see you. Councilman Brown. I want to echo uh, what my colleague Steve Short has said. And as a, a liaison city member with the Durham Housing Authority, I note that uh, technically there's no longer a Section 8 program. And by that I mean, and Steve, you can help out here, it's no longer called Section 8. Well, what is the new name? Housing Choice Vouchers. I'm sorry? Housing Choice Vouchers. Housing Choice Vouchers. So maybe uh, when you're talking with some future landlord, don't use the term Section 8. <laughs> Tell them you have a Housing Choice Voucher. And uh, maybe that will not carry the same stigma, perhaps, as some of the others. But anyway, thank you again for coming, all of you. Okay, let's move to the next item, which is uh, proposed economic development incentive agreement between the City of Durham and Frontier Communications of the Carolinas, LLC. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Manager, Daryl Solomon, Office of Economic and Workforce Development. I have a brief presentation on the uh, proposed agreement between Frontier Communications of the Carolinas LLC and the City of Durham regarding incentives for job creation. And just give me a moment to pull it. First off, the, the company profile. Uh, Frontier offers broadband, voice, video, wireless internet data access, data security solutions, bundled offerings, and more. The company currently operates in 28 states and has more than 18,200 employees based entirely in the United States, including approximately 244 in Durham. The project itself, Frontier is seeking to locate a site for a new call center to support operations from to be acquired markets. They're in um, negotiations, I guess, with Verizon. Um, so those negotiations have not been finalized. Uh, the employees that will be performing these new positions that will be created will be performing business to business and customer service duties. Uh, the facility would be located within the city limits in Durham. The potential job creation, the project is slated to result in the creation of 150 jobs over the three-year period from 2016 to 2018 with a wage range of 35,000 to 70,000, including benefits. Uh, the job mix includes, again, business to business and customer service duties. Um, Frontier has made it very clear to us in our negotiations with them um, that they would be more than willing to work with our NC Works Career Center system um, to source talent. And through that system, we also have access to leverage our um, relationships that we have with North Carolina Central University, uh, Durham Tech, and um, Duke University. Financing for the project, uh, the proposed offer is up to $430 per job for 150 jobs for a total not to exceed $64,500 to be paid in one lump sum. All the jobs must be created in order for the company to receive the full amount. Proration is possible if 85% or more of the jobs are created. And those jobs would also have to be retained for a minimum of one year. The conditions, uh, the, again, they would have to create 150 jobs within three years and retain those jobs for a minimum of one year. Completion of $4.3 million of capital investment within three years. 
inclusion of a workforce plan stipulating the use of NC Works Career Center as a source of the recruitment of talent as well as the inclusion of a Durham-based business plan promoting the use of Durham-based contractors and vendors, including minority and women business entities. Why is an incentive necessary? Uh, the creation of 150 jobs within three years, oops, I didn't go forward. The 64,500 in city investment, potential city investment is needed to make the project feasible in Durham because the telecommunications and IT industry, jobs within that industry are very coveted. Um, and there is strong evidence that without our incentives that the company would look elsewhere and move the project elsewhere. Uh, the, current, the company currently has a presence in Durham and this incentive could create an opportunity for expansion in Durham. And the state of North Carolina is proposing an incentive requiring an adequate local match from the city of Durham. Why this makes sense for Durham taxpayers, 150 high paying jobs within a growing industry, uh, those jobs would obviously add to the sales uh, tax, purchases through food, gas from the employees, traveling, eating out at lunch, uh, retention of a great corporate citizen. Um, Frontier has supported and they have pledged their support if we were to again engage in the telecommunications and energy training demonstration project, which we did undertake in conjunction with North Carolina Institute for Minority Economic Development, NCI Med. Also, they have pledged that they would support the Durham Youth Work Internship Program through hiring on some of our interns. And then two, with the quality and the name recognition of a company like Frontier, that's also going to assist down the road in attracting additional companies. And with that, we could take questions and comments. I would like to recognize we do have someone from Frontier here. Dennis Blos is with us. Let's say, first of all, this is a another piece of good news, economic good news uh, for our city and I want to thank Frontier for uh, considering to stay and continuing to, to grow in our community. I, I need to ask one question. I read Triangle Business Journal. Has the state already committed to this funding or not? The state, the, the announcement for the state was a timing issue so the state wanted to make their announcement today but they made it very clear to us all throughout our talking with them that their announcement was going to be that um, any state approval would be contingent upon local funding. So that's what their official press release uh, was, that local funding had to be secured before they would commit. And we told them, and they understood that that would not be taking place until this evening with the city council meeting. So TBJ was just jumping ahead of them. Let, let me ask, uh, are there, this is a public hearing, uh, so I wanna make sure that any persons in the public who have questions or want to comment on this and have an opportunity to do so. Recognize Ted Connors from the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor Bell, members of the Durham City Council. I'd like to also thank Kevin and his staff for doing a great job of pulling together the information and presentation on this. Uh, I'm Ted Connor, Vice President with the Economic Development with the Durham Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to kind of do a prelude. We've got two uh, public hearings back to back. And I just want to say, in economic development, we try to recruit a range of jobs that, cre that create a diversity of job opportunities for Durham residents. Recently, we worked with Harris Incorporated to retain and grow their distribution center in Durham, in East Durham. And tonight, Frontier may bring, we hope, uh, 200 customer service-oriented jobs to Durham. And shortly, we'll hear about Willow Tree Apps, which may bring another 80 to 100 uh, mobile application development jobs to Durham. This is quite a diversity of jobs to bring to our community. Uh, and one of our goals in economic development is to bring, always try to bring a broad range of jobs to the community in, in order to meet the broad range of uh, community resident job needs. One of the things in economic development, we always have to remember, not only do these projects create direct jobs, but they also create a lot of indirect jobs uh, for, uh, in their community for co other companies to service the needs of the company or meet their facility needs. Uh, Frontier has made a commitment to invest substantial sums of capital 
to upgrade their system in the next few years to enhance their competitive position with respect to other telecommunication products here in Durham and elsewhere. They are really moving to upgrade the speed of their service. And uh, today they provide gigabit speed telecommunications, and this is a critical enhancement of our economic development ecosystem that our clients find very important. And it's also critical to the future of our uh, economic development success. Uh, seems like communica communications is so such an important part of what we do in economic development and what our clients need. Frontier is committed to having a diverse workforce as it is a, a key foundation for its operation and allows the company to realize the benefits of its workforce and meeting the challenges of the current marketplace. Having a diversity of thought is very important. Frontier will start hiring its workforce if our community is selected for this new uh, customer service center this month and they will train these employees for three months before they, that center goes live. So this is a wonderful opportunity to prepare uh, a lot of residents for great futures. And Dennis, I hope that uh, we will be able to, with, our, with Durham's support and the state support, we'll be able to bring this project to fruition here in Durham. i will also like to thank the Durham City Council for hopefully for their support tonight as well. Thank you. Well, are there any other comments? I, I think it's pretty apparent uh, the opportunity we have here, and it seems to me the only thing we need to do is authorize the city manager to, to negotiate the contract, and hopefully if he's successful with that, we can beat out Florida, South Carolina, Texas, and Utah. All right. So moved. All right. Oh, you got to close the public hearing. Yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, so let, let's reflect no one else wanted to speak. i uh, declare the public hearing to be closed. The matter's back before the council. Move the item. Second. Been properly moved and second. Any further discussion here? None. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the next item, which is item 11, <coughs> proposed economic development incentive agreement between the city of Durham and Willow Tree, Inc. Again, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, Mr. Manager. Um, again, I have a brief presentation on the proposed contract between Willow Tree Incorporated and the City of Durham regarding incentives for job creation. A little bit about the company. Willow Tree provides mobile strategy, design, development, and analytic services for Fortune 500, 5,000 companies, and large government and nonprofits. Um, they have consistently been listed on Inc.'s 500, 5,000 list of fastest growing U.S. companies over the last four years. Uh, what's very impressive is that their major clients include HBO, Johnson & Johnson, GE, Turner Sports, Fox News, Harvard Business Publishing, PepsiCo, American Red Cross, McDonald's, Wyndham Hotels, the Comedy Channel, and the Game Show Network. Um, with these types of clients, Durham's profile as an IT hub would be certainly enhanced if we were to bring a company like this here. Um, they would be um, certainly a, a name brand that we could bring here and with the clout of their clientele that they would bring, that would bring recognition as well to Durham. The project itself, um, Willow Tree has signed several large clients in recent months and thus it needs to accelerate the growth of its team. Um, their expectation would be to grow an office similar to the size of their existing Charlottesville, Virginia office, 100 plus employees over the next several years. Um, their initial facility would be located within the American Tobacco Campus downtown. If they were to come, um, they would have to eventually identify a much larger facility to accommodate that growth. They do not have that facility identified at this time. The potential job creation is, is very impressive with a tremendous salary. Uh, the project is projected to result in the creation of 98 jobs by the end of 2018 with an average annual salary of $84,118 with full benefits. The job mix includes software developers, mobile designers, project and quality assurance managers. And again, with these types of jobs, that's going to add to the tax base um, through employees purchasing food, gas, commodities around in downtown. And again, they also have agreed to utilize our NC Works Career Center system 
And again, we could certainly leverage our relationships with Duke University, uh, North Carolina Central University, and Durham Tech's IT department. The project financing, the proposed offer is up to $750 per job for 98 jobs for a total not to exceed 73,500 to be paid over a three year period. And again, the possibility for proration exists if they create at least 85% or greater of the jobs. The conditions of the proposed agreement, the creation of 98 jobs within three years, they would have to retain those jobs for a minimum of one year, and they would have to adhere to the workforce plan stipulating the use of the NC Works Career Center and in, to encourage them to hire locally. Why is an incentive necessary? It's a tremendous project and opportunity for the city. 73,500 in the city investment um, for a coveted industry um, and there is very strong evidence that without this incentive that they would uh, relocate to another area. Um, they are also seeking these uh, funds to help offset upfront cost for training and developing highly skilled employees that they would be bringing on. And then two, the state of North Carolina is proposing an incentive which would require a local match. And why this makes sense for Durham taxpayers Again, the 98 high paying jobs within a growing industry, and we certainly have a, a talent source and a talent base here in Durham to assist them with, with hiring this level of high talent. And again, these jobs are going to um, bring a lot of additional sales tax with gas purchases, food purchases, things along those lines. Uh, the reputation and quality of the company is gonna help in attracting other quality firms to the area. Durham's profile as an IT hub, again, will be enhanced if we were to bring them on just because of their, the notoriety and the namesakes of their clients. And then the possibility of synergies with other Durham-based companies that provide related services allowing for joint bids on large projects, which could eventually lead to additional jobs, either through Willow Tree or other companies that they may partner with if they were to win uh, large bids. Um, this company, Willow Tree, has also agreed to support our Durham Youth Work Internship Program. Um, they have a, an existing practice of volunteering and, and speaking at local universities and community colleges, which they would uh, do so here as well. Um, the company is committed to creating high paying jobs, um, primarily recruiting from local universities and IT software boot camps and workforce development programs. Uh, typically 60% of entry-level employees are recent college graduates, and 40% are from coding schools or similar programs. Talented coding graduates from high school and community colleges would also be considered. And again, we could leverage through our NC Works Career Center, our relationships that we have with the School of Business through North Carolina Central, um, Duke University's Career Center, as well as Durham Tech's IT department. And then the creation of uh, high paying quality jobs is also going to be a multi have a multiplier effect. Um, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis using their regional input output modeling system, uh, it would result in the creation of an additional 200 jobs and $51.2 million in Durham and about 222 jobs and $15.6 million throughout the region over the next five years. And then also the um, hotel restaurant revenue that would be generated from their frequent um, company visits by their employees down from Virginia, as well as their clients. So all of our new fancy hotels that we have would be getting certainly a lot of business. And at this time we can open up for questions and comments and I would like to recognize we do have a company rep, Tobias Dingle from Willow Tree Incorporated here. Okay, thank you. Again, this is a public hearing. Let me ask first, are there questions, comments by members of the council? Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? Recognize Ted Connor. Mayor, I know this is a surprise, but I would have a comment. Uh, I will try to, try to keep it brief in light of the evening, but uh, I just will say that uh, if, if uh, Willow Tree Apps comes to Durham, which I hope they will, we'll be ga ga gaining a really exciting company That'll be a wonderful uh, ad addition to our impressive list of mobile app companies. If you want to ask me what mobile app companies are, I'll just ask uh, Tobias. 
Uh, but one of the things we have with our type of economy, with a technology-driven economy such as ours, it is essential that we keep expanding the depth and breadth of technology capabilities in our, com in our community to remain competitive. And having Willow Tree apps join our, basic tech, uh, join our base of technology companies will allow Durham to keep its economy progressing forward. Uh, it was great to hear that uh, Tobias uh, is going to remain active in our community. I know they've been active in Charlottesville, and hopefully we're going to learn a lot from them. One of the things that Daryl pointed out was about 40% of their employees right now go to a coding school. And I find that incredibly uh, exciting because that means 40% uh, of their, their employees don't have a computer science degree, which opens up job opportunities for our residents. As a member of the Business Services Committee of the Durham Workforce Development Board, we are looking really hard at trying to figure out how to increase the enrollment of students and residents into education and training programs for two of our major industry clusters, which is life science and what I call the IT informatics cluster. And uh, we feel by looking at this, uh, understanding what uh, Willow Tree Apps is doing, that we'll be able to figure out a way to integrate uh, some of our local res resources like Durham Public Schools and Durham Tech into our uh, community effort to uh, in better in engage our residents in uh, quality jobs here. So this is pretty exciting. And I just hope that, uh, Toby, so you will we'll be hearing something shortly if the state will allow us uh, on your company's uh, announcement here. This is just going to be a win-win for Durham, and I thank Durham uh, City Council for your support tonight. Ed, and certainly we want to um, thank you and Willow Tree in particular. Hopefully you'll be joining the Durham family. I think you find Durham a very exciting place to be, a lot of talent, a lot of energy, a lot of good things happening in our community, and you coming on the board just, just makes that a plus. And certainly want to thank Kevin and his, his team for making this happen. Um, if there's no further questions in the public, I'm going to declare the public hearing to be closed and matters back before the council. Second. Uh, the item is to authorize the city manager to execu execute an economic development incentive agreement with Willow Tree Inc. for a total incentive payment not to exceed $73,500. Uh, no further questions, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It passes 7 0. Thank you. Let me ask, are there any other items to come before the council tonight? Recognize the count. Did you have a question, Councilman Davis? No. Oh. No. Councilman Moffitt? Well, I just wanted to briefly just thank the people that worked on these two projects for because I think that getting these jobs in the Durham is a great thing. So thank you. Okay, if no further comments, meetings adjourn at 9 10 p.m. Thank you.